Welcome back, guys and girls, to my second episode of Database version 1.1. A quick summary of what this is all around. It's kind of a podcast, newscast, unscripted, look at the latest news and information, all done in a very fast fashion, with the additional element of having you guys and girls give me some questions, which I'll answer at the end of the video. So obviously you can fire those over on my Patreon as well. So let's kick it off with the very first subject, and it's actually a self-plug slightly, but something that's quite relevant, and that is... Uh, I've had for the past six or so weeks the Elgato HD60X, which I've just put the review up on my channel this week. And that is the very first VRR capture card on the market. So it's the very first card to allow VRR pass-through, so that's variable rate refresh, straight to your TV so you can plug it in and capture content and still gain the benefits of VRR where it works. And obviously you can capture that content, which means where it's fixing its predominant reason for existing, which is tears on screen and such like, they also get written into the capture. So you can remove issues with torn games, as you can see here with Dying Light 2. And obviously there's much more to come on VRR on the channel. I've got a deeper dive into VRR coming up very soon. So do go check that out in terms of the actual card itself. It's very good in terms of the price structure. It's replacing almost the HD60S. Um, and it's got quite a lot of options there in terms of 1440p 60, 1080p 120 capture, and it can go up to 4K and 30 FPS. It's a good compromise between having those VRR options, and obviously the team have obviously integrated a VRR capture option within their 4K software as well. That means you can see on screen the frame rate as the VRR is being fed to the device within the range that VR runs, in this case, 48 FPS up to 120 FPS and that means you can actually take that information and turn that into your own source if you want to. I managed to integrate it into my tool quickly with the help of the team from Elgato which I've been working on so fingers crossed it's an informative video and hopefully if you are in the market for a new capture card this might just be the ticket so go check that video out obviously there's good more information on that. So moving on to the next subject and that is the big debate around the uh, PS3 emulation all wrapped up in the update to PS Plus PS Now that Sony announced earlier this week on their blog. Little low key, it was a subject that I've discussed more over on Moore's Law. I was on his podcast uh, last week, we discussed it at the tail end of the week. Uh, I think that's up now at this point, so you can go and check that out as well. It was a good chat with Tom on that. Uh, I talk a little bit more about the whole kind of area of that and why it was a bit weird, but to summarise it here, not to go too much into it, it all feels like a solution to stop the bleeding of customers into other areas. So potentially more people have gone back to work, people are now back in the office, they've got less time at home, and therefore they're, they're making choices. Things are more expensive, they're saying, you know what, I can't afford PS Plus now, or I can't afford PS now, I'm not playing it as much, my kids aren't playing it as much, so I'll actually unsubscribe. So this feels like, you know, just a rejig, just to merge those two together. It wasn't done with a huge amount of fanfare. Um, it has got all the options there to obviously, you know, have old retro titles wrapped up in a monthly subscription there might be some things that i'll be looking at as well but fundamentally it doesn't really fit my bill as you know i'm not into subscription services i'm not into drm i'm not into that kind of stuff at all but the, as long as it's a choice and it doesn't replace the option it would be great to see sony implement the option to bring over games that you owned on previous purchases online into that solution so you can still play the same ps1 or ps2 titles you might have bought in the ps4 era or ps vita or psp and more importantly, have the option to buy these online and own them. Um, you can do that now with PS Plus and PS Now titles. That They're there as a subscription, but you can still buy them and own them. It's not a replacement of that. So I hope Sony keep that in the forefront of their mind and allow that option to still own and buy things. That's the most important factor for me. Choice is the most important thing, but if they don't take away choice, then I have no problem with it being an option for people. It's obviously a lot more to dig in at very early days. I won't discuss more on the whole process until we see more information on it when they announce it. A bit of a weird thing, which Tom quite rightly pointed out, which is they said in the same breath, We'll aim to do this by the by June, and then they all said by Q2 of 2022, which is the same date. That is indeed June 2022. Um, and obviously the big subject matter, though, is the PS3 emulation. So I see a lot of people online, again, talking about it's easy to do and we've got it on our ps3 so therefore it's running on lower PCs and there's even a version running on PS4 that works and all that kind of stuff. And the specifics around the PS3, speaking to developers over the years, reading documentation from developers over the years, everyone knows the PS3 was a very complicated piece of machinery. The SPUs were very bespoke. Ken Kutaragi had a very uh, original pioneering idea, making everything embarrassingly parallel. SPUs were kind of the precursor to a lot of what we do now with GPUs, but it's 
wasn't very well documented, there wasn't a lot of structure behind it, and therefore people had to find their own paths. Uh, and what you end up with is 10 plus years of development on the PS3, where a game made in the first couple of years might have done things one way, and a game made the same year or year after might have been done completely differently. Um, and the big thing about this, not to go into too much depth, and I can do a video on this specifically if there's enough interest from this discussion, so please let me know in the comments below. <coughs> A great deal of the complexity that developers had to deal with was the complete atypical design of the cell, the SPUs, the PPUs, the focus on vector data, its very unique token ring data bus design. It's all merely the tip of the architectural Everest that it was. One of the biggest hurdles even now is the sheer speed at which these can operate when leveraged well, which many teams did later on, both first and third party. GPU bandwidth is a, is a big issue still now, but these, the PS3, was relatively very fast when harnessing the bandwidth and that token ring bus that it used. The net result is developers leaned into the many defining areas of the cell, and to plug the gaps in that weak RSX or GeForce 7-ish type GPU that came from Nvidia, many of those methods are not well documented, not easy to replicate fully, even on modern hardware. The fact that you get many people online, even those that should know much better, stating that Sony can easily do this is simply wrong. The fact you may see a couple of titles running on RS PS3 on PC and even PS4 is nothing really due to the low documentation as I've said and that open-ended way to solve many problems, teams did just that. And as such, simple games can work as they just use the base PPE, PPU elements and the GPU with very simple and low demand code and yet even remotely more difficult titles have many of those SPU aspects within the visual effects, such as the post effects, the AA, such as God of War's MLAA, disabled in the emulation, even if they run at all. I could discuss this subject in much more detail, so I'm going to leave it there for now, but to sum it all up, even though some areas and even titles could and most likely can run on PS5, helped by that Tempest 3D sound audio being close to a single SPU of the PS3, None of this guarantees that they will run well or even better than old hardware. And that would likely be the case, we'd have performance issues and or other game breaking bugs, including and up to simply not running the title at all. And that's not viable for Sony. If somebody's making a free to sell online solution that's got loads of bugs and issues and performance is worse than the base hardware, people accept it because it's free. But if Sony's gonna sell it, they not only need to get that way beyond that level they need to improve the quality they need to get it to run above 30 fps they need to get it to run above 720p it's a very different commercial beast when you have to do all that and then you have to factor in is that worth that roi so that return on investment what am i getting back for that so i suspect what we will end up seeing is some titles being sold within the store that emulate the ps3 locally just like we saw with the ps2 and that four times integer upscale on the resolution and that's now become a solution you can download and play all these titles as part of this package locally on ps1 and ps2 so i'm sure ps3 will get there but it will be a slow long stage and it will be around the fact that they need to solve a problem currently they've got a solution you know in partnership with nvidia toshiba and ibm obviously with their rack solution to be able to stream ps3 native titles straight to your home that can't last forever it's not viable so it's all around whether there's a market to bring high quality emulation the higher and more powerful hardware gets then obviously it will become easier for them to do it. But right now, it's most certainly not an easy situation. But like I say, I'm going to park it for there. It's a discussion potentially for another time. Let me know what you think. That was probably quite a lot around one subject. So let's move on to the next one. The next one is some really good news. Resident Evil. As you know, I'm a huge fan of Resident Evil. I think it's an incredible series of games. I think it has a, such a long legacy. It's lost its way sometimes. It always goes up and down in terms of its focus. But fundamentally, the remakes, I think Resident Evil 2 specifically, was incredible. It really did a good job of kind of reinvigorating Resident Evil 2 as one of the best games of the franchise. It certainly was a huge title for the PS2. Um, even the N64, I think, had, had a pretty good port. But overall, uh, the remakes did a very good job. But they promised a lot of stuff, which never happened. Obviously, at the time, they promised ray tracing. They were partnered with NVIDIA. And for whatever reason, that didn't happen. Obviously, development issues and all those kind of concerns crop up. And the RE engine did support ray tracing later on with what they implemented within Resident Evil uh, Village. 
And obviously now they can use that common situation, backport stuff to your older engine, uh, your older version of your engine, bring in new features and then re-release it. And it's great that it's a free upgrade. So we're now going to see Resident Evil 2, Resident Evil 3 and Resident Evil 7 all getting ray tracing enhancements. And that'll fix one of the big weaknesses of the title, which is the, the SSR. The screen space reflections could be very noisy. The stochastic way that they um, generate screen space reflections a lot, just like ray tracing. It's all around the, the way they merge that together with the filter and the blending technique, and certainly the TAA, and that, that sometimes fell down a lot in Resident Evil. So it'll be great that uh, they'll add that to the title. I'm sure that's what this will be. There might also be some uh, GI in there. There's certainly an element of shadows and GI in Resident Evil Village. So. I'm really looking forward to seeing just what happens with those bounce areas and those reflection areas within the title. And I think it will really improve all of the games in terms of the visual aspect and a lot of quality. And it'll be interesting to see how they run on the Series X and the PS5 and certainly the Series S, which is always the one that I always raise a little eyebrow whenever I boot up a new game because it seems to be the one console that misses ray tracing more often than not. And obviously I've covered that in depth as to the reasons why. But it will be great that Capcom are updating these versions. It's great that it's free. It should be coming any time now. I'm assuming April, May is when they're going to launch the update patches. And I'll certainly be covering that as they happen. My platoon has suffered serious losses. Next up is Doom. Doom, the game that keeps on giving. So we... That, what is it 30 years now pretty much since the game launched and it's still giving and providing up teams opportunities or individuals to be able to do new things so ray tracing and path tracing is a big thing for older titles we've already had quake i've covered that many moons ago we've had many other titles updating it minecraft so all these simpler titles are good to do but doom is one of those ones that kind of is a bit of a left of field because it was the one right in between the 2D and 3D world. You know, it still uses flat billboard sprites, the so sprites are every character in the title. So there's a lot of complexity, or at least there's a lot of areas that don't flow as well with normal ray tracing and path traced solutions. But here we are with a complete path trace, reflections, light, shadow, everything being cast consistently around the world. And it takes into account these flat 2D sprites. So that means you've got a very improved visual aspect of Doom. There's obviously going to be areas that become up for debate in terms of do they look better or do they not. But the fact that this is, again, a free update, you can download it straight from the, um, the developer's patch. Uh, I think it's GitHub you can get it from. Uh, you can download it, gra grab your WAD file from either the, the free-to-play freeware version or the genuine release if you've got that. Drop it in, boot it up, and you get a path trace version of Doom. And it runs beautifully. It even fully supports FSR and DLSS. You can just take the INI, drop it into the file, reconfigure the boot up, and then away you go. You've got DLSS, FSR, with ray tracing if you've got you know, a slightly weak car. But it runs perfectly here at 1080p on my RX 2070 here. There's no need to go any higher than this, in my opinion, because the game doesn't require you know, 4K resolutions. There's still that limitation in terms of what it can do, and fundamentally, it's a great improvement to an old title. There's obviously areas that don't work as well, but it is excellent that this title has come out, and it's another sign of where I think path tracing is the, the holy grail in terms of ray tracing. It's where everything will end up, because it's the most accurate way of doing it. It's almost like ground truth. But there's obviously very early days. The denoising filter here and the way that they're generating the image quality itself is very good. Uh, I'll be interested to dig in more into what the actual engine is doing. And I'm currently looking at that for this weekend. So I have got a video coming up. I played it briefly last weekend. and uh, I've been enjoying my time with it again. So it's been good to get a, a refresh of just how ahead of the time Doom was. And how it still manages to remain totally relevant. John Carmack's engine and obviously John Romero's design has all kind of never really died out. Um, in fact, it kind of almost makes you sad how little the game has moved on fundamentally from way back in the 90s. So, Doom, it's never going to die, that's for sure. And in the spirit of that, obviously, if you do like Doom like me, then you can check out my old retro video, two-parter, which went through every single version and port of this classic game and just how good or bad each of those was. <laughs> So next on the list is a big area for me, VR title. So big fan of PSVR, big fan of PSVR 2, and obviously the PC space as well with my Oculus Quest 2. And I did make bold predictions about the PSVR 2 back before the PS5 was even launched. Many of those actually came true. The fully wireless design was not quite achieved, but I suspect much of that is down to power. 
that related area than just data itself. The Wi-Fi 6 elements I'm still convinced are core areas for the latest VR HMD and obviously the controllers as well. I did expect actually to be talking more about the shown titles at this point with developers having access to kits for a little while now and the latest Unity GDK talk on their VR engine updates were very enlightening. One area that was a big aspect and remains to be something of a very key importance was performance and some of those were a core design feature of the PSVR 2 rendering and that's now been painted and enables a huge uplift in visual quality and content even though the already vast boost in raw power the PS5 offers. The pervaded viewing is vital and something we saw used in PSVR titles that I covered on my channel such as Resident Evil 7, Rigs amongst others, temporary projection which will be another and even a very unique eye tracking feature of the headset enabling the game to identify where you are gazing and utilize the flaws in the human eye and brain processing to target fidelity on those focal points and reduce that pixel density in the periphery. This will be used in conjunction with that favated rendering to significantly boost performance. Again though, as I always state with these caveated demos, and normally they are best case scenarios and might even actually just be elements of the rendering itself, not the overall final image. But that all said, the Unity rendering lead did show examples that had two and a half times performance boost with just that favated rendering on and this increased to 3.6 times improvement in conjunction with eye tracking, with a noted minimal to negligible impact to image quality. That alone means we could be looking at average real levels of around two times increase in performance versus quality, bolstered even further by those reductions in the dual setup and rendering cost of both eyes on the CPU and GPU, dual refresh rate of the headset itself, again enabling 90 hertz and 120 hertz titles, which it also supports as well. And those time reprojection elements helping further improve those frame times, which means they could target 60 millisecond frame times and reproject that back to 120. And it would not look that far removed from current 2D titles. It suffice to say, combined with the HMD haptics and knuckle-like controls in generally very impressive specs, I foresee PSVR being a big leap over PSVR, in fact similar to the PlayStation 1 was to the PS2. I have much more to discuss and hopefully dive into in PSVR soon, and I'll be doing that as soon as Sony show off some of those forthcoming titles in a state of play event. Now, there's no insider info here, it's just an obvious prediction. In the meantime, you can check out all my older VR review videos over the years to see my clear passion for VR and why I hope this is a new impetus for the medium. Uh, again, hark back to my childhood days. Some developers are legends and some games are legendary. Ron Gilbert's Secret of Monkey Island and its equally groundbreaking sequel fall into both of those categories. When the very first EGA-focused PC and then Atari ST and Amiga ports landed in 1990, they just all hit the right notes and stood out within the genre and gaming entirely. Again, I've covered these in quite a lot of detail already before in my Atari ST and Amiga video, so go and check those out. And again, it's something that I'm gonna obviously cover in the future. But now we have a sequel to this hugely tongue-in-cheek title. Well, not as much tongue-in-cheek as right through its mouth. Both titles really hit home. And this new trailer they've now shown off brings that self-flagellation and excellent art back again. Ron Gilbert himself is back on board and that really what entices me at the moment with the fact that many of the team members are rejoining to make this genuine sequel. Remember he left LucasArts back in well, 1992, three it was, right after Monkey Island 2. So he's never been really involved in any of these titles in a proper meaningful way until now. So I have high hopes for the quality of this. Now generally, I'm not a big fan of these retro callbacks that often feel like a cash-in, but this has been a secret two-year project, and again, it's taken me back to the old days, with reveal only months before release, and I'm already counting those days down to when it is. My anticipation and expectations are high, and if this manages to capture some of that humour, adventure, and fun of the very first two, then LeChuck, Elaine, and Guybrush are going to be crossing swords and scathing tongues once more. Did you know that I can hold my breath for ten minutes? And that is the end of the subjects to discuss, but there are a few questions to discuss that have been provided by you guys and girls on Patreon, or even on the actual YouTube channel last week. There's one that I've 
pulled out as well. So I'm not going to answer them all. Uh, there's a couple that I'll hold off until next week just to keep the flow going, but I'm going to answer a few of them here. So here is the first one. So Unicron from Patreon asks, uh, the controllers, the PlayStation 5 and Nintendo, literally every blooming console, Switch, have really pushed the boat out with their latest controllers. The immersion can range from fantastic to just normal. Along with VR interaction, do you see them pushing game controllers even further and how? Uh, well, that brings us back to the VR thing, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think the knuckles and the integration in terms of that haptic feedback, both on the controllers themselves and obviously on the headset, will make a huge impact to VR. So one of the big issues with VR is the fact that sickness can be still very high. So a lot of people can't play for very long periods or it just completely puts people off. So I think that one of the things here is that people will find that the haptics and vibration on the headset will actually help a lot with motion sickness and all that disorientation that can happen quite quickly because your brain is getting confused where it's seeing motion but it's not feeling motion. So I think a lot of the VR headset, the HMD, will have this kind of pressure put on your head, a little bit of jiggling around if you're you know, screaming through a street on a motorcycle or if you're tilting upside down, it can put pressure on either side. So that will really make a difference in terms of utilizing that headset to reduce the amount of sickness you're getting, but also just really draw you into the game far more because then you'll have visuals that are far superior to what we've got now, but also you'll feel part of the game because you can actually feel some of the impact. And again, I think the haptics on the controller, there'll be triggers that potentially can push back against you, just like the dual sense, that vibration and those micro vibrations. So really controlling the level of vibration all the way through means that if you're holding a sword in both hands and you hit and defend, it could actually vibrate through the actual controllers themselves. So I think there's a huge amount that we're going to see from these controllers and the integration of this within the game itself. And obviously this is all bolstered even more by the 3D sound that will come with this as well. So yeah, generally there's a huge push towards the entire PS5 being almost designed with PSVR 2 in mind. I said that from the start, I've always thought that. Uh, I think this is going to be a real evolution of what we're seeing with the DualSense. Um, and I think it will be another step forward in terms of that interaction. And I think it will be a big part that people will discuss once PSVR is out and I hope that you know we start seeing more of that with the controllers themselves and just going beyond what we've seen as the standard and I've got to applaud Sony for really pushing forward on that uh, next question is again from Unicron I'll take another one from himself which is uh, with the PlayStation 5 it finally seems that we are truly back to what consoles were originally about so quick access to games plug and play and at a price point 360 pound digital model that's acceptable in the inevitable slim model, what do you think will be changed and or cut to reach that £250-£300 price point? Uh, I don't think they'll cut much at all. Um, I think if they go for a cheaper price, uh, I think the, the cost of reduction of manufacturer, potentially a reduction in the actual die size itself, so they'll go for, to a smaller nanometer size, 6 nanometer, maybe even 5, I don't, I don't know. So by reducing the wafer size, they can save a bit of money because they get more from the same wafer, so potentially uh, less yield problems and certainly more units. But also, the cost of things have dropped. So SSDs are significantly cheaper now and significantly faster, potentially. Um, RAM could be... Uh, an issue because RAM is very expensive um, and there's a chance that RAM can get much faster now than what's possible when the, the consoles were made. So they tend to downclock a lot of the RAM speeds anyway, but unfortunately, that's still a quite expensive area for these. So I'll be interested to see what they do tweak and change. I think design will be one. Uh, if they can reduce the size of the board, they can reduce the, the cost of the heat. And they've already done that with updates already on the PS5. So that'll be a big area to save money and save cost. And they should possibly be able to bump up the speed the size of the SSD and obviously keep the price to a similar level. So in summary, I think that the reduction for SSD cost, the reduction in manufacturing cost, the better yields and the improvements to reducing the heat sink process and reductions in manufacturing and then economies of scale that come along with that, I think fundamentally they'll probably be able to knock 50, maybe $100 off a unit price for the slim. Let's just see. Uh, Stephen Savage Yuga Salazar says, uh, Salazar actually, hey, 
parts of the Caribbean. My question is, do you think multi-plat game engines like Unity will start to implement their own game engine type of Nanite, such as Unreal 5, or do you think they'll rely on hardware-based dynamic cooling like mesh shaders, NVIDIA, AMD, or geometry engines such as PlayStation? Um, I think they'll go for the dynamic cooling processes that are there. So... I don't suppose we will see another nanite from another engine. Um, the problem that you know Unreal Five is, is, is becoming ubiquitous and everyone's jumping to it. That's that's a problem in that sense that people might start using nanite. But nanite's got a lot of restrictions and limitations in terms of how it can be used. You know, dynamic meshes and animated meshes are not possible um, in terms of that. And you saw that in the Matrix demo I covered where they swap between them. So there's definitely solutions there, but there's, it also kind of favors things such as solid geometry buildings rocks all those kind of things it won't favor things like you know foliage and trees and bushes and anything that moves around water interaction all those kind of areas so there's definitely limitations with how they can use it and that's why i think other options will maybe come to the fore um, dependent on the game type so certainly the geometry engine and how that works mesh shaders will see huge differences and we've seen improvements already from the nvidia demos and what amd have shown what microsoft have done on their mesh shader process and certainly sony have been working hard on their geometry engine in terms of handling that culling of meshes to keep the amount of pixels and certainly the amount of geometry being drawn on screen to a bare minimum and not overdrawing all the time which is obviously the the big wasted cost of gpu still to this very day you know spending time calculating drawing um, working out depth color and then saying oh, actually i don't need it i'm going to discard it halfway through so the quicker you can discard things in the pipeline the more effective it is and sometimes that can be huge increases to performance and obviously huge increases to fidelity um, again i think a lot of these things will improve everything but certainly vr will be one area they can improve so yeah, I think it's. I don't think we'll see another nanite, but I think we'll see a lot of different teams using the options available. It all depends how genuinely different and or stroke easy the mesh shaders and the geometry engine are for teams to use. I think that will dictate how often teams use them or don't just roll their own and try something a little bit more unique. But I'm sure Nanite will get a lot of legs. Um, I just think so far at the moment, it still needs work because it has a lot of limitations in terms of what you can create within the game. Okay, the last one today is from Don't Poke the Bear. <laughs> Very good advice, that. Um, okay, so can you think of any of the game studios that might benefit from ditching a proprietary engine because of tech debt? In my opinion, I would like to see 343 ditch the Halo engine since Infinite is clearly a patchwork job with an insane load of tech debt. I would like to see Microsoft advance their studios with properly developed engines, Infinity Warded Software, Playground Studios, and have them help develop the technology and tools for studios who struggle with engine development and support like 343. Remember when third-party studios used id Tech 2 and 3 all the time? It's a shame, in my opinion, that id Tech 7 is only being used for Wolfenstein and Doom games. I'm going to cut that down. So, I mean, great question. I did read this on the uh, YouTube, and I actually said that I can use it for the video because I thought it was a very good question that a lot of people might be interested in based on the bit last week about Red Engine. So, absolutely, 343, um, they would benefit greatly by just going to Unreal Engine because they don't have or they seem to struggle with managing and developing their own engine. As I covered, you know, a couple of years back in my video before Halo came out, which is the troubles with Halo and what I thought was the reasons. Again, that's not me saying that's fact. That was me saying what I thought based on my experience and knowledge. 343 absolutely would benefit from moving to Unreal Engine 5. Uh, benefits would be, you know, multiple. Uh, it would be easier for them to develop the engine or game that they want because they've got a huge community of people that they can support. They can get access to talent from different studios that have got experience with Unreal Engine, so it means they don't have to worry about the internal uh, technology level and you know people who are, are an island because they're the only one that know how to do certain things and it would remove some of the restrictions that clearly are present in there but again let's stress there is more issues in terms of 343 than just the engine they're using so yeah absolutely they would benefit uh, i think dice would benefit i think dice is a, an amazing engine in frostbite but most of the people that built and started that are, are gone long gone so Johan Anderson is gone um, and all the other team have set up a, a new studio. And again, that's one that's known to be difficult to manage and use in terms of its aims. It's designed for linear titles predominantly, not open world adventures. You could, you know, use it to do other things, but it's not really an engine, I think, that would 
do as well with the scale of titles moving into open world as it as probably Unreal Engine would because of this again that shared development that economies of scale that you get out of it. There's probably some studios in Sony that would benefit. We, we saw that, that Bend used Unreal Engine for Days Gone, cracking game that didn't get enough love and praise. And that they used that engine incredibly well. In fact, some of the best reconstruction in terms of image quality I've seen in a long time, that, that the, the TAA they use in that title. And they really utilize that for an open world game very, very well. So it's not just about the engine, it's also about the talent and the team. Um, and I think that, Again, that might be a level that Sony look at. I, I mean, you know, they've got a lot of engines internally in Sony. So they've got the, the Decimer engine, they've got the Naughty Dog engine, they've got the Sony Santa Monica engine, they've got the Sucker Punch engine, whatever powers, you know, um, Ghost of Tsushima. Uh, and that's a lot of complexity. I mean, the Decimer engine's got a lot of legs in terms of going outside and being used for third party teams as well. Again, could be more complicated depending on what your aims are. But again, it's all around that front end, the tools, the documentation, all of those things. So I think that there's going to be a level of kind of convergence naturally because we're getting to that level now where it's like the film industry where there's only a few studios that make big blockbusters. That's just how it is. It's, it, sadly, it goes that way. So I would be ashamed to see that happen with just Unreal Engine. Um, Id Tech is a absolutely amazing technology. It always has been. I think it's in good hands with uh, the team that are still managing that with Tiago Souza and the rest of the team. But I don't suspect they will change their engine. Um, obviously, the big obvious one from the Microsoft side would be for Bethesda uh, and to get rid of the horrendous um, engine that they've been using for Fallout forever. What is it called? The nuclear boy engine i forgot what it's called now but that engine is just horrible um and it just keeps getting wheeled out over and over again so they would absolutely benefit from moving over to that uh and i think some of the smaller teams would so uh cry engine is a great engine brilliant engine um, but the team struggle to make games in a very fast fashion so i think that they would be another team that would benefit from moving over to something else and just putting all hands on deck in terms of utilizing the power more uh, but again, I'm not advocating for this because I'm a big advocate for teams to have their own engine and you know forge their own path and try things differently. So it'll be interesting to see if we do see bigger teams drop their engine based on what CD Projekt have done. But there's probably a big list of teams that could do it uh, and it would make financial sense and potentially free up people to spend more time on things they want to do rather than, you know, fighting all of the intricacies of the engine and just trying to battle to get something to work rather than spending time refining it. And that's the biggest enemy of any production state. You know, if you're spending time fighting the system or the, the your controls to get to what you want, then fundamentally you cut corners elsewhere because you don't have the time and effort to get it done. So it'll be interesting to see where and who starts jumping ship to Unreal Engine. I do suspect that CG Project Wed are not going to be the last, that's for sure. Epic have got a lot of money and they are keen to get as many people on board as possible. Just having that proprietary engine being actually a third party sale does lock a lot of teams in. So yeah, watch this space. Obviously more on that to discuss. Probably not the best answer on that question, but hopefully something or other that did. And that's it for me. That's another video to a close. I do want to kind of just stress I've got more content coming up, so do check out. I've got that Horizon Zero Dawn one comparing PC, sorry, Horizon Forbidden West compared against PC Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, I did want to look at GT7, but I'm just going to move that out of the way for now for the sake of other things coming up. I've got some new titles coming up as well, so definitely check those out over the next couple of days. And again, that deeper dive into VRR as well. And some retro stuff coming back onto that, so I've got a few that I'm trying to finish off. Uh, one of them being that Dreamcast one, which I know a lot of you have been asking for. I just wanted to add a little bit more to the video, and unfortunately things got in the way with a lot of the releases around January, February, so I had to put it on the back burner and just... Uh, I have got a little bit of time free next weekend to finish that one off. So it will be coming. Keep an eye out for that. Uh, and that's it. Another database done. Hopefully not too long and waffly, but probably a little bit. But it's always hard when you're just recording and releasing. Any thoughts or feedback, just leave it down below. Otherwise, I will catch you on the next one. <laughs>